Close. Hello, good afternoon to you all and be very welcome to this seventh edition of our monthly hangout, uh, community hangout. It's a real pleasure to see a full house after uh, well-deserved vacations, I hope, for all. And we are thrilled uh, to uh, start this uh, with this uh, topic of Web3. First of all, I will give you just two notes about our activity in Startup Portugal, two quick notes. The first one is that for you founders that want to be part of the Portuguese startup representation at the Web Summit, uh, please uh, apply to Road to Web Summit. It's a program that uh, we develop to take Portuguese-based startups to the conference, and we prepare them, and we do a boot camp, and we give also uh, advantages and, and a support to this presence. So please, if you are interested in this, apply until the 9th of September, so until Friday, please hurry up. The second note about our activity at Startup Portugal is that we, are, we have been very busy in the last month preparing a set of, a set, uh, of big, uh, important uh, supports, public supports to startups and to entrepreneurship. So we are now entering a final phase of discussion of this with the government. So I hope in the next weeks, months, to give you some additional news and feedback about this uh, subject. Now on today's topic. It's impossible to ignore the number of Web3 communities in Portugal. The new internet has been more and more a promise for solving many problems related to privacy, concentration of power, how we own our data, and who has the power to its transaction. But on the other hand, Web3 as you know, has also been a space for many scams. They have generated doubts within the community on whether it's a safe spa space to develop new products and to invest. The question sometimes is, how can we act and regulate Web3? Today, we are honored to have with us exceptional guests to this talk. Diogo Monica, co-founder and president at Anchorage Digital, a Portuguese-founded unicorn, a global regulated crypto platform that provides institutions with integrated digital assets, financial services, and infrastructure solutions. Fiona uh, Designi, innovation principal at Farfetch for the last three years. She has shaped the new strategies at the luxury e-commerce group level and notably in the 3D and metaverse area. Nuno Lima de Luz, tech and Web3 lawyer at Quatro Casas, providing legal advice to several projects within the virtual asset industry and president of the Portuguese Association of Blockchain and Cryptocurrency. And Pauline Fossil, founder and director at Artpool, the first social network to build an international community of curators. She has the mission of connecting artists, curators, and art lovers. The conversation will be moderated by Tim Smith, senior reporter and Iberia correspondent at Sifted. But first of all, and before the conversation, I would like to welcome for a warm-up pitch Anna Nedospavzova, Head of Design for Interface Labs, a social mobile app with human-readable Web3 feed. Anna, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow, so bright. Okay, thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here and pitch in front of you today. I'm Anna, I'm a co-founder and a head of design at Interface. Uh, my other co-founder couldn't make it to the pitch, but he'll be here later. I'm just saying it because usually it's him pitching, so we'll see how it goes today. So since it's a Web3 event, I suppose that some of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the space and probably with the problems and limitations that it has. More specifically, 
we know that information within the space is quite scattered. We have protocols, we have block explorers, we have NFT marketplaces, all that kind of stuff in different <coughs> websites, different spaces. You can barely reach it all and gather it all together and get familiar with it. Furthermore, we know that uh, user experience is quite frankly lagging behind in Web3. So there is so much more to improve and make it more user-friendly, especially to newcomers who are not familiar with the space yet. Another point is that current builders are mainly focusing on the web. So we, as interface, are focusing on mobile first, and I'll be talking about it a bit later. Yeah, so our solution is a mobile app which enables users to discover individuals, projects, and opportunities through a readable feed. We do it by um, gaining all those scattered pieces on, of information within Web3 into one concise and readable feed, so users can follow each other. Here, users can follow each other, or protocols, or contracts, or NFT collections, or whatnot, get notified once certain transaction took place, then see it all in a one single concise feed, and of course, they can also discover new opportunities and people and content and so on. Furthermore, we want to enable users to understand that Web3 goes beyond just NFTs and wallets. For that, we instead of wallets, we use profiles, so it's an actual human being behind a profile. You can see who else follows them, you can see the transaction, you can see the tokens, NFT saves, whatever activities will be adding more social graphs to it. For now, we're still in beta. Um, furthermore, um, we, this is, these are the current features that are already available now. So we uh, were the first ones to introduce integration to Gnosis Saves, for example. So this is especially useful for DAO members. You can see your DAO safe, you can see who are the signers, who are, what are the tokens, what are the transactions that are being performed, so that's pretty much useful if you're part of that DAO. Uh, also the governance in the feed, it's not just you know token swaps and NFTs, sales, purchases, whatever. You can actually see when somebody votes on certain proposal and you can see the explanation why they, the reasoning behind the vote basically. Of course, we're not alone in the field, there are other competitors doing going into similar direction, let's put it that way. So there is, of course, Etherscan, Block Explorer, which is beautiful and great, but hardly readable and user-friendly. Uh, we have Context, which is focusing on uh, NFTs. We have um, portfolio managers such as Zapper, Zero, and Debunk, who are also trying to integrate feed, but for now it's uh, still in, in development, so we're still pretty early. Market, I'm not going to talk about market much because, you know, we, we're all early. I like this quote from uh, the recent report uh, by Andrew Horowitz uh, in, in their recent research paper. They said they compared the current state of crypto to the state of commercial internet in 1995, which is pretty cool. So we understand how much more, how more, much more users will be coming, how much more opportunities will be coming into the space. As for the roadmap, we're currently in closed beta. We're available in, on iOS and Android. Um, we initially raised publicly, pu publicly on a platform called Miro. It was a public crowdfund. We raised 150K. We're now raising 2 mil and have already 500K commitments, confirmed commitments. Um, yeah, for now, the functionality includes following wallets, live notifications. Users can label transactions themselves, so we kind of you know, integrating them in the process as well, so they're building the products together with us. Um, we'll be launching the app publicly in Q4, and then also by the end of this month, we'll be introducing our own indexer, like the improved version of it, where we've indexed all the blockchain, all the transactions that happened so far, so it's gonna be pretty smooth and really fast, and we'll tr be introducing the new feed, so we'll make it even more readable and understandable for anyone. The team is five people currently, so it's me, a designer, my co-founder, uh, a crypt, real crypto native and a full-stack developer, 
who will be coming later today. Then we have an iOS lead, Android lead, and the backend engineers, plus some contribu contributors. Uh, as for the traction, I've already mentioned that there was a public pre-seed of 150K. Among the early investors were some noticeable fi figures. So uh, it was Anton Bukov, the co-founder of One Inch. It was uh, proof of attendance protocol. It was RSS3 and Mask Network. For now, as we are in beta, we are have gated access to the app. So people apply to get access, and then we'll get back to them within a day or two. For now, we have 600 verified users and over 3,000 applications. I think it's pretty cool that we have 2,600 followers because we've been growing organically all this time. We haven't spent a cent on promo, on marketing at all. So it's all been organic. We have a few famous individuals using the app and promoting it within the space. So that's pretty cool. And we have 11, how do you say, 111 particle holders the particles a bit later. Yeah, so the community has been really responsive and uh, engaged. Here are some of the reviews that we've got. Uh, and here on the right side, you can see the particle. So it's basically the NFT that gives you immediate access to the app, but it's just a minor part. It also makes your profile stand out within the app, also a minor part. The biggest part is that you basically become a shareholder of the company. So when we have a, a token, distribution in the future, those people who hold the particle will get um, allocated the tokens. So if you want to learn more about our app and maybe apply for early access, you can go to this website and you'll, you'll understand it all once you get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> uh, so now I want to call Diogo. He's online. He will just join us now. Diogo, can you hear me? Can you hear us, Diogo? Yes. Okay. Let's hope we can we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so Diogo, as Antonio said, he's a co-founder and president at Anchorage Digital. I also want to call Fiona Dizengi, ex innovation principal at Farfetch. Um, Nuno Lima da Luz, tech and web three lawyer at Quatre Casas and president of the Portuguese Association of Blockchain and Cryptocurrency, and Pauline Fossel, founder and director at Artpool. To moderate the conversation, Tim Smith will be in the stage. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, those are on. You can hear me. Great. So yeah, welcome to this talk and part of the Above and Beyond series of monthly events from Startup Portugal. Firstly, a big, big thanks to Startup Portugal for putting this event on and also for having me. It's been really brilliant to be in Lisbon for a couple of days and special thanks to Patricia and Mafalda for making it all happen. So just a quick intro of who I am and what Sifted is. As they said, I'm the Iberia correspondent. I'm based in Barcelona. And Sifted is a Financial Times-backed publication covering European tech and startups. We're a startup ourselves. We were founded three years ago. And yeah, we've grown to 60 people. We've got reporters all around the continent. And please come and talk to me after the event. It's my job to try and cover what's happening in this region. So if you're a founder or you've got something interesting to say about what's going on in Portuguese tech, I'd love to hear from you. I'll also be here for Web Summit. So if you want to exchange details, <coughs> please do. But anyway, let's get on with the show because we've only got 40 minutes and a lot to talk about. Uh, so the title of the talk, Web3 Hype or the Future? Uh, and it's a good place to be talking about this. As Antonio already said, Portugal has become a favorite destination for people working in this space, partly due to tax conditions surrounding cryptocurrencies, partly due to crypto enthusiasts, digital nomads settling here and building products, but also, of course, because of the very highly skilled tech talent that is available to all founders in Portugal. So, you know, it's a brilliant place to be talking about this as a natural home for people building the products of the f internet of the future. So we're going to be talking about today who's designing this new internet, what are the trade-offs in a decentralized web, how can it be positive, and what are the risks of negative trade-offs in the digital age, and we'll talk about how, and when, and what form it's going to arrive in. So nice to hear that pitch about one of the forms that will arrive in. Thank you, Anna. 
so I was going to get you guys to introduce yourself, but Antonio did a, a quite a good upsum. So instead, I'm going to ask you all to just talk about how and why you got into Web3. What excited you about it? I'll start with you, Fiona. Cool. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's working well. Uh, yes, I'm Fiona. Basically, I left Farfetch uh, recently. I was innovation principal. Uh, why Web3? Uh, actually, I went to Web3 from 3D. Uh, 3D was my first entry point. It has been basically through thinking of fashion and how fashion was evolving, like digital has been something quite natural back to 2019 already. And it was all about how basically 3D is changing the way we, we see fashion, we consume fashion. Uh, and basically beyond the product experience, uh, the whole infrastructure of Web3 came up and how basically you could create a much uh, enriching experience beyond just a, a nicer product experience. So I've been interested to this and, and going into more how, how we could create something more uh, you know, sustainable and yeah. how this could change basically the industry. Brilliant. And Nuno, what about you? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I've been in the, in the, the crypto space uh, for a long time. Uh, I have a brother that uh, is five years younger than me. He, he, was an, he is an engineer uh, and he presented me the Bitcoin white paper back in 2012, maybe, around that. Uh, around that time, uh, we mined a lot of BTC <laughs> when the rewards were like 50 BTCs per, per block. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we, we lost our private keys at that time. It didn't add, add much value. <laughs> so it was just uh, a gimmick, a little gimmick, internet gimmick. No one predicted that uh, at that time, uh, at least uh, there was a small, a small part of people that um, already envisioned that Bitcoin and blockchain and everything else that came afterward uh, was going to take up this much space and it, it was going to be a, a solo industry throughout the world, a globalized industry. Yeah, but I, I had contact with, the, with Bitcoin first and then afterwards with, the, with the Ethereum in 2015. Um, and since then, uh, the adaptation of the metaverse that already existed into this new, uh, this new, new whole industry um, where we can have tokenized property and we can exchange property with other people that we don't really know or meet physically. So uh, this new layer that goes on on top of the internet that we already had um, brought a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of people into this new industry, a lot of creators and a lot of developers. Uh, and yeah, basically I'm here for a long time, since a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, shame about those private keys. Yeah, um, <laughs> Pauline. Never again. <laughs> Pauline, what about you? <coughs> so on my side, um, well, I've worked in the art world for more than a decade now, um, and I've worked in you know institutions. I, if you heard about underdogs, I've been co-directing with Vils, the gallery. So I've been working with artists for 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 quite a long time. And um, my last endeavor before Art Pool was I was uh, the director of development of a private institution in Hong Kong, and I was so doing fundraising, looking for money uh, to put back in the arts. And I started Art Pool, that is, it was introduced, and it's still a, a social network for art curators, but today the curators can create collections of NFTs. Um, and basically, we are doing that bridge with, uh, you know, spaces and art lovers. We are giving like the access to print the NFT as well that you can have in the space. So, I uh, went into NFTs because I was looking for a solution to, um, you know, create new digital revenues for the artists, but also their ecosystem. So, you know, curators, institutions, galleries. Uh, I do believe that you know the art world is not uh, exploiting the digital. And I had all these things in my mind, and I went into NFTs like it's going to be almost two years, uh, and realized that was just like a little point of the iceberg, and you had like so much more uh, tools that we could be using, and so reflected on, you know, how we could um, we could bring those tools to the art world, trying to find ways to translate them, um, and 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 have a message that that the artists and the people working with them could understand to come on board, uh, and so that's what I've been doing for, yeah, more than a year and a half now. 
Brilliant. We'll talk lots about that. And uh, you, Diogo, thank you for joining us remotely to give us a bit of, of a background on you. I'm sure that you can hear me. You can. Uh, can we hear Diogo? Yeah. Yeah? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, it's better now. Fantastic. Perfect. Um, well, I guess what, what I do is I, I help um, institutions not lose their private keys. So uh, and, uh, this is the, the most basic summary of what Anchorage does. And uh, I didn't quite come into Web3 as much. I got rebranded into Web3 uh, because obviously Web3 has a rebrand. Uh, A16Z led, Andreessen Horowitz led rebrand of crypto is, um, is basically what I call it. And so we've uh, obviously been talking about it for, for a long time. In Anchorage, what we do is we only work with institutions. We do not work with retail and we help them build products in crypto. So we are the first federally chartered bank in the United States. We have an actual banking license like JP Morgan Chase and all the big banks, and we help institutions anywhere from the other banks to sovereign wealth funds to the government itself uh, come into the space and build products. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, is the mic still on? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with a personal question, actually, because I think, you know, there's a lot of skepticism, skepticism sometimes around the world of NFTs, as Antonio touched on. Is this all a scam? And whenever I get into these conversations, I'm quite resistant to them because personally, as someone who for a content for a living makes content and writes and creates stuff that goes on the Internet, it's very frustrating to see how essentially the big tech flat pl platforms have taken a lot of the revenue from creators and through the, basically being advertising companies and being gatekeepers to the Internet. And I've always thought that that was a broken system and that the people who are creating value on the internet and creating the reasons that people want to be there aren't seeing the benefits. So Pauline, you touched on better revenues for artists. Talk about how you think that can happen via Web3. It's interesting what you just said because um, you know when I went into, and when started researching and reading a lot, and so I was, I was clearly skeptical, right? Like for the reason you were saying, and. And I was like trying as, as well to wrap my head around the fact that, you know, artists are in the world I was like, we're creating physically. So how could they actually do something that could be selling online? And, and I had a really good talk with, uh, with an artist I'm really close to. And I was, you know, trying to challenge him. And, um, and he was the one telling me, really look into this, look into NFTs, look into what's going on in there, because that could be really helpful for art pool. And, um, and I was skeptical and he told me, but look, like, actually, how many people are seeing my pieces in person? How many people are going to museum when I have a show? How many people are going in galleries? Most people see my work on Instagram, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's what it is. And he was telling me, why would I never win from actually having my work online? I do a lot of work of communicating online and I never get anything out of it. And in addition, I need to pay being seen. So I was like, hmm, okay, makes sense. Um, so I think like there is there is different approaches for the creators, for the artists to, you know, pit, like come into the space. Um, I like the, I like several point of view and with Artful we decided to take one of them. Um, but the first one that is, that I like as a curator because I'm, I'm also a curator is I, I like the fact that you know, the artist can work with devs and can p really understand the technology and really like educate, like, and create works that are really kind of native for for the digital space. This is something that really interests me, but I think these are s these have some limits um, because if you want to grow and get way more creators on board, you cannot just think like each creator will make that massive effort. Um, and so that's for that's what I was kind of explaining for me like one very um, smart way for, for seeing NFTs, for example, is, is, well, it's what we are taking. So we are taking a very simple idea of art editions. Like everyone is having in mind that you can repeat a, 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 an image of an artwork, right? And you can own that at a lower price than a unique piece. Um, and the NFT is removing the entire complexity of doing art editions. Um, so you don't have to you know, put money into production. You know you don't need to uh, pack. You don't need to send. You remove all of this from the creator, which is pretty smart. And you know people can still print because you still get an HD image, and you can still live with the work. So these are an approach for me that is really interesting because it allows us to onboard way more artists into the space. 
Of course, you know, you create revenues because each time you sell a piece, like the artist obviously gets a way higher percentage that they would have um, with, with the space that would have probably to pay for production. Um, and, uh, and then after there is obviously like everything we talked about, like we always hear about the royalties, the royalties, but this is also like, it's great, but it also depends on which platform you resell. Does the smart contract like remain the royalties? Like I know that we have to put it right now manually when like it's on OpenSea. We have in our smart contract the 10% for the artist, but each time the piece goes on OpenSea, we have to go manually say there is actually a 10% for the artist when there is a resell. So to scale, this is a little bit crazy, right? Um, so you need to make sure that you have a secondary marketplace and it happens on your, on your uh, place for this to be respected. And I think this is, um, yeah, well, I think that's, uh, that's part of the reply. I think it's a broad question, you know, but. Yeah, definitely. And I'll go to just another kind of skeptical point that a lot of people talk about with Web3, uh. which is um, environmental concerns and sustainability. We all know about how environmentally demanding mining can be of cryptocurrencies. And when people talk to me about this, I always think, well, people are also collecting physical things in the world all the time. They're collecting little plastic toys or you know, uh, trainers or baseball caps that have a nice brand, which also have to be made somewhere. So people, for some reason, don't see that there's a, you know, a sustainability issue to other forms of collecting outside of NFTs. And I want to ask you, Fiona, is, you know, sustainability is such a big issue for the fashion industry. How do you think that you know, Web3 and this world can create a fashion industry that's better for our planet? Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed, fashion is a, is a real problem uh, in terms of like, the way its uh, items are created. Traceability is still something that is not very, um, very you know, clear. Um, and Web3 is seen as a way to bring actually transparency uh, in the choice of material, the way the, 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 the items are produced, and bring that into, into the blockchain. So I think this is a hope for the, for the industry. Uh, clearly, what is not really seen is that beyond the product, uh, the creative process, the, the creative production of uh, basically the whole fashion industry in terms of like uh, photo shooting, in terms of like uh, e-commerce, you know, integration, like how you distribute the products to different platforms and all of this is, in is incredibly also uh, not environmental friendly. Uh, and you have to actually send the samples physically to each people, um, all influencers, each places. So you have incredible, incredible cost also and uh, like transport basically. So I think that like digitalization of goods um, is seen as a way basically to shortcut all of this and make this disappear. So we actually did at Farfetch, we experienced this. So we digitalized items uh, to sell them in pre-order. So we didn't have any sample, didn't have any item. And we actually launched that with only 3D assets that were digitalized and added on people virtually to create photo shoots. And this has been done with zero like basically costs on, sustain, uh, on like the environment. So I think this is seen also from this perspective, from a backend perspective, uh, production perspective, and like a process perspective, it's seen as very interesting for the brands and for the whole industry. Yeah, brilliant. Diego, I'll go to you actually, just because you work with institutions kind of building Web3 products. Tell us about some of the ways that you know slightly more institutional organizations are starting to adopt this and you know how are they doing so yeah so we we jumped into this business somewhat by accident if i'm being candid one of our largest clients is a company called visa that i'm sure everybody has heard of and one day one of the folks over at visa essentially sent me a text message and said hey i want to buy a crypto punk that was it and so we had to figure out how to buy CryptoPunk for a visa, how to you know, source it, how to pay for it in crypto, how to custody it, and how to store it. So in fact, what we do have today is not only we have Visa's CryptoPunk, but once we announced that Visa had bought a CryptoPunk and it was custodying it in a bank, in a digital bank at Anchorage, all of these other clients came out of the woodwork. And to, to give a little bit of context, our initial type of client was VC firms, crypto funds, and family offices also the exact types of clients that are known to actually go on the edgier side of the curve and buy assets like these. And so we now have 
monkeys, apes, gorillas, punks, anything. It's a whole zoo up in here. And uh, all these institutions have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, um, of NFTs. And so well, what I see is a little bit of a different type of narrative, which is these institutions have bought in to the projects that they believe are the better projects and are just holding them. And they don't touch them. They don't trade them. They just uh, put them in custody. They store them. And there's whole NFT funds, about $300 million NFT funds that just buy NFTs and sit on them and have a time horizon of seven to 10 years. And so that, that's what I see on this side. I also see a lot of infrastructure investment, a lot of integrations. I obviously see the volumes of NFTs um, coming down pretty dramatically, but institutions have a very long-term horizon for their investments. And so they're not trading in and out of these things. What they want is to have, to own a little bit of um, the most important projects. And, and that means buying a, a set of NFTs of each project and then holding them. And, and we have a lot of them on the platform right now. I think that shows that it's such early days, doesn't it? You know, the, the sort of where we are with the value of these things. It'll be so interesting to see what happens to those funds in seven years' time. But coming to you, Nuno, someone who advises people working with virtual assets, what are the kind of, you know, tell us about some of your clients and about some of the naiveties, perhaps, that you need to educate them on as they start to enter Web3 and using virtual assets. Yeah, so... Uh as a technological enthusiast and also as a, as a lawyer, I have to stay in between innovation and the constraints that somehow uh, legal aspects bring to, um, to the development of new ideas and new companies within this new industry. Um, we have to tackle with a lot of um, uncertainty in legal terms because there was a, like a we copied a lot of taxonomy and definitions from the financial world that we are trying to somehow correlate with the, this new, new whole industry. Uh, and that's our major difficulty because um, the, the, old, the, old, the Web3 uh, industry and environment, uh, it's not only, uh, does not only have a financial um, perspective, but also a very large utility perspective. NFTs brought a lot of utility uh, to digital property uh, and the definition of digital property. We also have a lot of utility tokens. Back in the day, we had Filecoin. It was one of the first uh, where you have a token that you can swap for, for, an, uh, for storage, uh, digital storage. But we also have all the cryptocurrencies that serve as a store of value or a means of payment somehow. So we are trying, I see it as the, the, the regulators and the, the, the lawmakers are trying to encapsulate everything with a catch-all approach that sometimes doesn't fit all. Uh, well, well, actually, it never fits everything because uh, we have a, an approach to, to, to cryptocurrencies and crypto assets from a financial perspective. Somehow making correlations with, uh, with the financial industry, we have SEFTs or simple agreements for future tokens now we have evolved for, for token grants, but uh, when all, it all started to finance a, a startup or a company, we, we did ICOs and we had SEFTs, which is, which is a, uh, an adaptation of the, the safe uh, or the, the simple agreements for future equity. So we adapted equity to tokens when sometimes it doesn't correlate. We, we can have a token that it's something that we yeah. use on a product or a service, um, but it's not a share, it's not share capital. You don't have any kind of right to the profits that the company make. You just have a token that uh, you can exchange for something within the platform and only within the platform. Of course, we have a lot of um, secondary markets, we have exchanges where you can swap that token for other tokens of other projects, still utility tokens, but you can also exchange that for fiat currency and that has an economical value. So sometimes, uh, the founders, uh, we have a lot of great ideas, I don't know. That, that's a major problem for all startups, even Web 1, Web 2, whatever. Not even on the web, it, it doesn't have to, to be on the internet. But sometimes we, we deal with a lot of uh, founders that have great products, great ideas, but they have no clue about what is left to, to what it's needed to have a company, to build a company, to, to have employees, to have accountancy, uh, how should they deal um, with tax regarding crypto, with utility tokens, or even the cryptocurrency they receive, 
when they make an ICO or a token generation event, they promise a future token. So um, my advice here is uh, just browse for, for lawyers to understand the technology because these lawyers will have to tackle with the regulators, with, um, with the lawmakers. There's still a lot of discussion that must go on uh, and we need a lot of case law within the, 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 the setting stone rules that we have for traditional environments that are being somehow interpreted uh, according to this new world industry, but we have to, um, we, we need to have more discussion, more legal discussion, and to have more bindable decisions uh, that give more clarity <coughs> on this whole new ecosystem. Yeah, we'll come back on to, you know, some of the regulatory questions and, you know, in a, a borderless metaverse, how that gets regulated. But I think it's a really interesting point about people trying to translate issues from Web 2 or, you know, the previous digital world into Web 3. And a question for you, Pauline, is about, is there an issue around, you know, artists just seeing NFTs as glorified JPEGs and, you know, kind of translating an understanding of digital art from Web 2 into Web 3? And how difficult is it to have these conversations to make people see the value in this transfer? And yeah, like how resistant are some people, I suppose? Um, I think there is, well, there is a resistance as anything that is new. Um, but uh, but I, personally, I don't have that much uh, experience with the resistance. I think like each time we, I end up talking with artists or specifically curators, uh, would then talk to the artists. Uh, it's very positive, um, and I, I really think it's it's the w the way you explain it, the approach you have, um, the material you give as well, right? Because um, it's very complex, and it's also until where can you explain the complexity for not be making it a barrier, you know, for creators. So it's it's also that's what being a platform, right? It's to try to give the right tools, but not necessarily give too much to overload people um, and create trust. So um, I, I I know what you're talking about, and I think like uh, you know the art world is is uh, is known to be very opaque and and quite elitist and and um, you know scared about what can can be new or putting in jeopardy what's happening already. Um, but in the end, like in reality, concretely, when I'm talking to people in the art world and we explain them like the, the you know, the approach we have, we have extremely, extremely good feedback and, and a will to, to stop coming in, you know? So, um, I mean, in, in many talks, like we do, we talk a lot about education, but that's true. Uh, it's it's a little bit the cliche of the talk that comes and comes back, but it is education. It is ex you know, explaining how how to come in. What does it mean? All this, all these things that you hear and and see how actually you can you can work with it and what can be the outcome for you, without necessarily understanding and being in a, in a very complex world. You know. Yeah, for sure. And Diego, I want to just come to you now because <coughs> in terms of, you know, the, the topic of this talk is hype or the future. And I think, you know, the situation you just described of, um, you know, these like people like Visa wanting a punk or a board ape, that was really at the height of this hype, right? And I just wonder how attitudes have changed as, as you said, NFT volumes have dropped. You know, are they still keeping them as their Twitter profile pictures? Are you seeing that there's like a different kind of enthusiasm as we move into this new phase where we're trying to find real value just beyond hype, perhaps? Well, I mean, it's not it's not our first rodeo in terms of it's not our first rodeo, of course, in terms of volatility of the space. It is our first rodeo in terms of meaningful interaction, participation from the industry and from real institutions, so to speak. And it's the first drop post, say, 2018, 2019. And in, in, in actual institutions having built products on it. What I see is the same long-term horizon that venture investors and crypto investors have with regards to both NFTs and just cryptocurrencies in general. They also, these institutions also have with regards to partnerships and creating something meaningful. Let me maybe set the context that they didn't come into crypto for some, some of them obviously came because there's a monetary value tied to 
trading these or providing loans with crypto collateral. And they just see obviously a business that they want to add, but some of them just see significantly new ways of building products or efficiencies in their settlements or in their remittances or what have you. And so throughout every single one of our 37 plus different client types, we see that the large majority of them are likely not slowing down the partnerships or not slowing down the partnerships of the things that they have high priority. What they were doing though, is they were doing five crypto things, quote unquote, at the same time. And now they're doing three crypto things at the same time. And so there's still a lot of excitement. They have 18 to 20, 24 month long horizons in terms of actually building a product from the conception phase to actually coming into production in one of these big institutions. And if you're talking about a bank, it's actually closer to three to four years for them to start a project and for the project to actually be shipped. And those things are not stopping. In some cases, they might have taken a second, uh, second priority. Uh, for example, obviously, the war in Europe actually has been, you know, the top priority for many of the banks in terms for, for, for the past um, year. And, and then some of these other some of these other partnerships actually take a, a second step. But now we're seeing them come back to the forefront and, and them continue making progress. I think one particular thing that is interesting to note is that institutions, in terms of partnerships with NFTs themselves. Those continue, but those are the consumer brands, which are a very unique client type that I have. Think about the largest consumer brands in the world, brands that sell shoes, uh, brands that sell jeans, what have you. Those are the client type that continue investing in NFTs, creating collections, um, integrations, partnerships, all of those components. And so those continue to be the most excited ones about NFTs. I would say that there's very little interest from the infrastructure, from the banks, from the other types of institutions around NFTs. What they are interested in, in especially the banks are around still the financialization of uh, the internet. So the DeFi elements, the lending against crypto collateral, and then you have corporates, you have companies that are just like traditional corporate companies, and they are very interested in stable coins in settlements. So they see uh, a stable coin that they can move during the weekend, especially in the United States. We still have a very backwards um, system around ACH and SWIFT. T plus two transactions that settle in 48 hours, banks close on weekends, there's no finality to these payments. You can't really create applications on top of these infrastructures without a very lengthy six to nine month minimum process around QIC and, and actually like validating your, your use case. So a lot of the innovation is happening on stable coins. And a lot of these corporates are realizing that payroll is 10 times more efficient if they're done in stable coins, especially on a fast transaction blockchain versus them using just traditional fiat rails. So lots of stuff happening, different verticals, different institutions have different focuses, but all of them are making progress in their own independent verticals as they were during the bull market. Maybe not with as much urgency, maybe not as many different types of projects at the same time, but still going on. We come back to more of that sort of structural behind the scenes stuff, but just to finish up on, you know, kind of NFTs and brand partnerships, Fiona, how have you seen that shift as we've kind of gone through the last two or three years in terms of the way the brands have engaged with Web3 and crypto and NFTs. Have you seen a shift? Yes. Uh, I think that NFT was, you know, like has made such a buzz, especially, I mean, industry I know well, like fashion. Uh, everyone saw it as a kind of answer for reinventing the brands and like, you know, finding a way to connect with the uh, expanding basically the creativity things where they were kind of feeling too much constraint into web two, um, but no one knew <laughs> how to do it basically, and so there were a lot of like uh, you know fail failures and and also it was very seen as just a very short term marketing campaign, and you know like a lot of exploration as well. I think that the brands start to understand that uh, one NFT is a meme. <coughs> It's just a tool, and it depends how you use it. Uh, and it's, 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 but it's an enabler. So it means that if you use it well, you can actually augment the brand experience. You can, uh, it's true, like push the constraint in terms of like the way you represent the brand, attract new audiences, uh, but also I think really break a very important topic for brands that they had always challenged for years, which is loyalty. Uh, basically. An NFT is a way to create a one-to-one -one engagement uh, connection with, with, with the customer and to do it over time. And I think that this is something that the brands didn't really understand. 
that actually this is not just one shot, it's not acquisition only, it's also retention and how you nourish that over time. And that's basically the challenge is how to make a sustainable basically, you know, impact when you when you when you go into NFT, you have to think over years and you have to think about experts as well, because clearly the challenge is huge. Like you have to think of smart contracts, you have to think of, you know, the way to communicate with your audience, uh, integration, um, crypto, wallet. And also you have to think about the fact that the users are clearly not crypto natives. Most of them are just brand fans. S and how do you deal with this? Like you have to think of, you know, payment in fiat, for instance. So I think there's a lot of things that the brands start to understand. Um, but, uh, but it is also how this is transforming. This is actually at the core of their digital transformation as well in terms of like loyalty, CRM, infrastructure of how they deal with their customers. Yeah, and I think, you know, one example I've seen of like trying to build that belonging between a brand and fans is uh, football clubs. There's a company called Socios. Uh, I think it's Spanish, but anyway, it works with clubs like Barcelona FC to create sort of fan experiences and fan tokens. And I want to ask you, Nuno, like, I think when people first started learning about blockchain, the idea was that it was immutable and that one transaction happened here was fully secure over here. Do you have to do some education with people about how to build security systems that really make sure those things are secure and you know how how big a misconception is that about the security of the blockchain yeah that, that's a really great question because as anna said in the presentation of interface we are still very early in everything so uh, the adoption of the internet in 1995 i was on i, I had the privilege in 1995 to have internet in portugal <laughs> and i've been dealing with the internet since then with esoteric it was a internet service provider that uh, happened to, to operate in Portugal at the time. Uh, the level of adoption of the technology is still very early. So I think we are still talking to the bubble, to the, to the enthusiast bubble. The NFT uh, acquirers, the, the token acquirers, everyone that invests in a specific token that wants to participate in a specific platform is still a very uh, shortened uh, and um, very closed environment. Uh, I think the road to adoption will have to, um, to make use of, um, let's say, a public service adoption of blockchain. People will need to use blockchain without knowing that, that they are using blockchain. That's where we are going to see uh, a fully-fledged level of adoption of the technology because everyone sends emails. No one knows what is TCP IP or UDP or any kind of protocol that sustains the, the transmission of a, a simple line of text to another person in, the, in, in Australia from Portugal, let's say. So uh, until that happens, I don't think we'll see a level of adoption besides the one that we are seeing now with a lot of creators but talking to the to their co-founders, to the, to the, to the co-adopters, to the bubble of the Web3 industry. Regarding safety, well, uh, all the, the, the cypherpunk movement and the cryptography associated with, uh, with blockchain already provides a, a level of security um, on the assets that we own. Um, not with the stupidity that I've committed in the past, but I think we have a lot to, to, to go on and a, a lot of things must, must be thought uh, and a lot of uh, awareness must be brought to, to the participants um, in order to make them understand the virtue uh, of private property, of freedom, all the, 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 the liberal, the true liberal, liberal um, thinking that one must, must adopt to, to be in this, in this industry as well, because it's a, it's a global free industry uh, where we can be the true owners of our property. Uh, and that's a fantastic thing that everyone should try to understand first. The, the, the whole concept of, of the, the crypto industry, um, whatever form or name that people want to give it. So um, safety and, and, and privacy and, and data protection and all those, those terms, uh, all, they all derive from, from freedom and private property. And crypt the crypto industry bring a lot of uh, independence to people um, and the safeguard of that, that property, either through NFTs that represent an underlying asset, 
uh, or as an access or a membership card to, to, to uh, that custom, the customer loyalty programs that brands want to have, uh, or an access to a physical good that we, w that we, we will have in the future. Um, but the, um, yeah, I think we need a lot of awareness, even to the lawmakers, even to the persons that define whatever I'm going to interpret to, to help the, my clients uh, throughout my, my, my activity, my normal activity. Uh, lawmakers should be aware of the, the technology itself before they say something that can bring a lot of hindrance to, to the industry as well. But yeah, uh, I think I, I took a lot of steps here, yeah. but uh, there's a lot to say <laughs> always about no, this topic. Yeah. And I think it's I'm sorry. No, no, it's a good answer. And I think it's really interesting that point that, you know, right now we're seeing under the hood of it and, you know, we're not seeing a very good user experience as Anna pointed to with her pitch for interface. But I wanted to ask you, Diego, about, you know, what are institutions doing in terms of trying to take away the sort of the clunkiness. I tried to buy an NFT on MetaMask. It was very difficult. I did get it. But, you know, like, are we still going to be having to get, you know, paying gas fees and using cryptocurrencies in the way that we currently are? How do you see the way that this will become, I don't know, user sanitized? Look, I think as a general rule, I never bet against engineers. That's just a rule that I have in investing and in life in general. And uh, betting against engineers is always a losing proposition. The people that said that computers aren't ever getting enough processing power or they're never going to be fast enough or the internet is not going to have enough bandwidth, everybody has always been wrong every single time in the past. So here I feel like there's a lot of um, you know obvious solutions and being worked on. Number one, gas fees. We do have layer ones that have a lot higher th throughput. We do have vertical scaling, we do have layer two rollups. The set of solutions is just so wide and so large, and there's such good solutions for these problems that that it's um, it's pretty obvious that something will emerge. Of course, those solutions come with different trade-offs in terms of decentralization, different trade-offs in terms of sovereign resistance, different trade-offs definitely from a blockchain like Bitcoin, but for a lot of the use cases, and if you consider the fact that there's going to be bridges between every single system and you already have cosmos based ibc where these things are natively interoperable between one another and so communication intercommunicate inter blockchain communication as a primitive is actually been very successful in the cosmos ecosystem and continues to be so i don't think any of these issues around gas fees around transactions around um, nft drops being completely uh, swamped by uh, by the network itself going down or, or being being effectively denial of service all of that will go away in, in, in order. And then the investment, the amount of dollars that are going to companies like Magic, companies that are just making it a lot easier to do wallets and identity and uh, easy to log in and easy to purchase these things. And also just people in security thinking about social recovery. How do we actually take the best of self-custody, which is this individual responsibility and the ability of owning your own assets, but also create some of the best of the somewhat centralized solutions where you're not just uh, fully responsible for uh, your loss is permanent loss. And there's a system that continues to have great sets of trade-offs from a security perspective that still allows you to lose your assets, have your house burned down and not lose all of your life savings in, uh, in Bitcoin denominated um, uh, in, in Bitcoin terms, right? So you'd have social recovery mechanisms, you'd have uh, dead men chests, you'd have whatever mechanisms we actually come up and, and become popular. But there's so much investment in making this easier, so much investment in UI, so much investment in UX, so much investment in usability, that I don't think these will be problems for long. It's just a matter of continuing, uh, uh, continuing letting the space do its own thing. Um, so that's, that's my opinion on all these things. And I think it's that point, isn't it, that we touched on at the start, that we are at the very early days of this phase of the internet. And it wasn't that fun to go online in 1995. So, you know, that tells us something. Pauline, what about you? Like, in terms of building your product, how do you think about building interface, user experience, and interoperability? Like, how do you see the way that people will view art in the metaverse and Web3 as we go forward? And what are the kind of stumbling blocks at the moment that need to be ironed out? Um, well, it's, it's, it's very going along with the, with the reply that that they did. Um, for me, it's simple. It's easy payment, easy wallet, and gift tangibility. As if you fill out these three things and you have you extend the channel of distribution, 
uh, physically because I think like still people need to understand the use. It's it's not just digital, you know, like there is many different type of use and you need to onboard people in an easy way in a physical space as well still and then bring bring them on board in, you know, metaverse and so on. But still I think like, you know, all this like everything interoperability I have a very big problem saying that word since forever. Um, I mean, yes, it's 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 all where we want to be out and aim and stuff, but like uh, really concretely, like what can be done now? There is a lot of things that are being done uh, that we can already use uh, to bring more people on board. And 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 I really join what you were saying. Like, you don't need to know the technology behind. It's us, the builders, that really join forces to put all these tools together for bringing more people on board and you don't even think what's behind, you know, because it's it's well built. Sure, I guess beyond transactions, I'm wondering how you see people engaging with art in Web3. Do you see that, you know, there will be whole parks of art? I'm a big video game fan, so I'm a huge fan of virtual art myself. And it feels as though there's so much potential to build really incredible art in a 3D space that people can move around collaboratively. Minecraft comes to mind. Like, how do you see it evolving? I, I was in a in a talk last week in Prague where we were talking about the um, the suit from um, from Tesla, oh yeah. and this is crazy. Like basically, y this is a crazy technology that you can use in the metaverse. If you both have suits and you are in the metaverse and you touch each other, you feel each other. So imagine the power of this for artists that can create entire immersive installation within a metaverse, and you actually I don't imagine a wave and you feel the wave on you like. Is this going to give opportunities to artists and museums as well, just to touch objects, you know, and feel them? It's going to change your relation to art. So definitely, like I, you know, I don't, I, I can't even imagine when when we'll get there, uh, what it will bring to to the artist and to the museum and the educative sector, you know. Yeah. yeah. And what about you, Fiona? Because obviously, fashion's a form of art, and like, what are fashion shows going to look like in the metaverse? Do you think? Is it going to open up whole new, you know, genres of fashion, do you think? Uh, yeah, no, I think that the way, I mean, the extension that we have in art will be also impacting fashion and, you know, the way you interact with the garment, uh, the way you can have a digital asset on your avatar and you wear it as well and, like, highlighting different identities of yourself. Uh, I think this is also what really attracts, uh, basically, fashion, uh, because it's all about identity, expressing yourself. Um, I think that fashion shows, uh, digital world is a great opportunity for, it's an amazing opportunity for fashion, because, because I think the brands and fashion has been very constrained by Web2, by e-commerce. The rules of e-commerce are very uh, crazy in terms of like, you know, scrolling templates, the way you put the product, the way, what you can integrate, how you can show the garment, the, the texture, the inspiration. Crazy even today, like for a website like Farfetch or whatever, everyone is limited and constrained. So digital world is kind of reinventing, kind of breaking the whole rules of scrolling, infinite scrolling, and you know, how you integrate product and all of this. And it's kind of still connecting with the, the purchase, uh, but with a way different experience. Uh, today in Metaverse that we know, like Sandbox, Decentral and so on, they are quite disconnected from the e-commerce and transaction you know, possibilities. So I think the challenge for the brands is to find the bridge between both, is how to integrate this digital world in an e-commerce framework that is still working and, and still having the ability to convert. Because at the end of the day today, even if we talk about digital assets and, and so on, the brands are still into the idea of like converting you know, to physical item right now, but expanding the brand, uh, the brand experience. So I think what is interesting as well is that for fashion shows in the metaverse, it's also opening the accessibility to these fashion shows. Um, and also, I mean, it's still a f social experience that is not happening in real life. It's quite a passive experience normally, a fashion show. Here you can kind of change completely the experience of, you know, like the audience being able to talk, to react, to pre-order, to uh, co-create potentially. So all of this is opening also the, the opportunities. Yeah, and you mentioned there how it opens up whole new things about how we engage with our own identities. And, you know, identity is quite a thorny issue in Web 2 as it is. 
we had a story about this uh, at the Euro finals where sadly England lost, but uh, you know we missed a couple of penalties and it was players of colour who missed the penalties and there was a lot of racism and there was a huge conversation around should these identities on Instagram, should your identity be attached to your real identity? And this is going to be something that's even more prevalent in something like the metaverse where you are embodied more and the possibilities for harassment and abuse are definitely there. How do you think, Nuno, identity and you know the attachment from your identity in the physical world will be attached to the metaverse? Do you think we can be anonymous there? What, how do you see that developing? In the metaverse, as we had in the past uh, with massive multiplayer online gaming, uh, online gaming like uh, World of Warcraft or whatever, uh, people created avatars or representations of themselves. Uh, I remember in World of Warcraft where the humans had some kind of slang language against the orcs <laughs> because they were from other race, even in the, even if it was a lower race or a digital race. I think there will always be bad people and good people, wherever they are. Uh, I think the metaverse, and it depends on the platforms, on the terms and conditions, I think s some kind of, it's not, a, it's not a thing of regulation or laws against it because we already have uh, criminal codes that apply wherever you are uh, or um, wherever you interact with other human being, uh, either online or offline, it, it doesn't matter. I don't think we need more regulation on that type. We need just we just need more um, more positive feedback on on the interactions that the people have. Um, I think in the metaverse you can create. It depends. You can create the avatar that you want. You can represent yourself the way you want. Um, but um, yeah. Um, I really don't know beyond uh, terms and conditions of the usage of a specific platform uh, or the, the normal interactions or the law that we already have that are applicable uh, to those to that kind of slur language or those kind of, that kind of bad behaviors do, do, wouldn't apply to those situations. But with uh, with all the Web three and the, the blockchain technology, we are seeing nowadays um, judici judicial uh, decisions being. Uh, applied through blockchain, through NFTs. Um, w yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I th I think it was in um, uh, it's it's very recent in the in the UK. Uh, someone ordered uh, another person. The, the 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 court ordered someone or or give a notice of a of a judicial decision um, through an NFT through the to the wallet of that specific person. Um, I think. The old world will will evolve um, to that point where the traditional uh, interactions of of the of the, the citizens will be conducted uh, through metaverse. Even we, you can have a, the, a court session through metaverse. And nowadays we have lawyers know that we have a lot of uh, of hindrance uh, um, getting getting to notify someone to be present on court physically. With all this technology and the metaverse, I, I believe that we can have a, a judicial ses session, a court session, where everyone is on board. The judge can be uh, analyzing everything uh, on a decentralized way. I think that's possible. Uh, regarding regarding your initial question, uh, sorry, I try I tend to divagate on. It's right. I think the point is is yeah. that you know, when Bitcoin arrived, people. Yeah. It's, it's something that can be done quite anonymously. And uh -huh. I guess, is it easier to separate your identity uh, in Web3 and be hidden and no one find out that you did something wrong than it was in Web2? Well, it, it's very easy. People have that misconception that having just an address, uh, we are fully anonymous. It's just a pseudonymous. Because nowadays, if you let's say you have a wallet, you have to interact somehow with the uh, with uh, with a brand, with a platform, or something. That's all very traceable. It's actually uh, a very a very common misconception that people are uh, safe or or always safe using um, uh, cryptocurrencies or using blockchain. 
uh, to interact. For being identified. Yeah, yeah, companies like Elliptic, CoinFirm, mm -hmm. uh, Chainalysis, they can track you down uh, if there's the need to. Yeah. Um, so somehow you will interact and you make an off-ramp, you will exchange your tokens for other tokens, even if you use, uh, yeah. So uh, it, it's very easy, it's all public, it's all, it's all searchable. Uh, that's a, a very big misconception. It's like a 2015 narrative that doesn't apply anymore because you have a lot of tools uh, to eradicate wrongdoers from doing any kind of so wrongdoing. You, you don't see that being an issue in terms of being able to trace, you know, wrongdoing. I don't. There's, I don't see it that way. Um, and even the platforms can can make some sort of QIC uh, to interoperate with uh, within the, uh, a metaverse platform. Uh, to ban bad actors or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Or even you, you can just block, if you, you, you can just block an address and that person cannot use the platform. There are several ways to, to, to prevent or to coercively, um, uh, uh, coercively uh, mitigate problems afterwards, so I don't see it as a problem. We we always had um, we always had avatars and and pseudonymous personas uh, in all the platforms that we had in internet relay chat. Yeah, um, in the I guess news as groups, you pointed whatever. out though, there has been problems with abuse in platforms like World of Warcraft. We have so a lot of abu abuse off off chain <laughs> yeah, in real right. life. Yeah, yeah, it's just perhaps so it's people feel people maybe feel more empowered to do that when they they don't. It's not face to face. Yeah, exactly. Fiona, exactly. were you going to come in on that? Sorry, were you? You had something uh, to say. Um, sorry, I forgot what I was. Uh, no, I think what is interesting is that you, in Web three, you actually can segment more your data than in Web two. So in Web two, you don't have any control, but in Web three, you have the ability to decide which data you want to convey to who. And I think this is interesting because it's kind of segmenting and micro managing management of your identity and having multiple identities. Of course, what everything is traceable in your public in your, in your blockchain, but I think it's interesting because you can be different identities, which is something you actually can't really do in yeah. real life or in Web2. And Diego, just coming to you as someone who's working on some of these like more structural things behind the scenes, what are the c some of the security upsides that we can expect from Web3 in terms of, you know, perhaps, yeah, keeping data privacy more secure and having a sort of fairer online world? I don't know if Web3 on its own is going to get us there. I think the revisiting the fact that centralization of data is bad and revisiting, like we're doing in Web3, the fact that Yad's model is bad. If you think about it, a lot of the aggregation of data has been because it's extremely profitable to provide you slightly better ads with slightly better click-through rates than if you don't have data. And so data aggregation starts as a necessity to make more money. And once the alignments are incentive like that, then of course, you're going to store as much data about as many individuals as humanly possible. Web3 makes the pendulum go on the other side towards decentralization, towards privacy first. And just that thought process already makes people actually create these products with a lot more care and thought around privacy. There are projects like Privy that are pretty interesting. Essentially, what they do is they allow you to divest yourself of the information of your own users. So you can create a Web3 application without actually owning any of the data of your users, but still create the application and just have this tokenized service that does the right things, does the GDPRs, does all of the encryption, does all of these services for you. And so you don't actually even accumulate data. So Web3 has been very good about teaching people how data should be thought of not as oil, or as the new oil, but as toxic sludge. It is toxic sludge that you're accumulating that at some point is gonna poison you because it's gonna get hacked and it's gonna get leaked and you don't want that kind of liability. Yeah, well, that is that is encouraging because you know I think the scandals around the web two gatekeepers have been some of the worst and you know in terms of data privacy. And talking about that, Pauline, I mean, talk about, if you would, how artists have in terms of like the data that they have and the way their art can be copied, like what are some of like the main pain points that we hopefully will leave behind in terms of Web2, in terms of digital art and the way that artists have had to engage with the internet? That's a big question um, about copy. I think it's, um, I would put it on the, on the collector's side, <laughs> on my side. 
I think it's to the collectors to you know, check to their due diligence. Where are they buying? Is that really the artist behind? What is the platform? Um, because yeah, we are specifically talking about NFTs, right? It's, it's very complex to, um, for an artist to not be copied uh, if, if it's out there, you know? Um, but then it's, it's to the person buying the work. Um, and I, I mean, I don't see any, no, no, maybe you could help me, but I think I don't see any other way for avoiding this, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think with NFTs, as long as you can identify uh, the person, as long as you can make a connection between the person that created the NFT or the underlying uh, IP uh, that sustains an NFT or a representation of art through an NFT. If you can make that connection, everything afterwards that the traditional physical world uh, will Apply, fall apart yeah. because you, you, had a, you have a lot of counterfeiting of copies or illegal copies yeah. in the real world that you will need to have a, like a, an expert analyzer. Uh, yeah, on, this on at least it's yeah. maybe actually, yeah, I more secure yeah. if you well are able to trace the, yeah. Fraud the creator. And, and counterfeiting, you know? it's, yeah. it's harder. At least in theory, it's not possible with yeah. the, with blockchain. So I mean that's it is, but uh, <laughs> the, the depends. It depends a lot, but uh, you can make the correlations. It's uh, it's uh, verifiable by the yeah, buyer. Yeah, no, but I mean, if yeah. the buyers actually look for the information, they will find it. You know, yeah. and and it that's yeah. that's. That's it's, avoiding it's, that. it's easier to find. You don't have to rely on a, on a written document saying that uh, it's a certified yeah. original by someone. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking of you know artists that I know who post their stuff on Instagram and it's constantly being stolen. You know, so yeah, but this goes on the collectors. Like, where where do you go? You know, I we the whole art pool page and artworks. There is someone that did an OpenSea account with the art pool banner and taking all the images. You know, so yes. As a collector, you need to go and check on the different diff communities on the website to make sure that this OpenSea account is actually the official one, and so on and so forth, because it happens to every single person that is putting works out there. So really to the collectors to go and check and, and look what's the platform, is the artist really working with the platform, what's the trust behind it, um, and, and do your due diligence like you would buy, you know, I don't know, research, you know? a lot of uh, service providers that can do that traceability or on-chain analysis on the, the provenience or the origin of a specified NFT. Um, and there's technology to do it. And that will prevent a lot of this yeah. uh, digital counterfeiting somehow. Yeah. And uh. yeah, just like we, we are working with a, with a platform and Logon, and they are creating, like they have a pool of experts of, uh, they're not lawyers, but you know them. Uh, um, heard. And uh, and they are actually creating certificate that goes into each NFT that you can download and and you know it's like physical people that you can get accountable as well and they check the platform they check the orders they check like the whole thing so yeah yeah so new solutions to you know slightly different problems I can see Patricia there with her mic yeah we've got, we've sorry got a <laughs> questions. we really need to finish but I would like to yeah. so if someone we have time for two questions so is there anyone here Pedro can you there's a mic just behind you <laughs> thank you uh, I'm Asit from Pakistan uh, I'm here with my startup uh, related to beauty industry under the startup visa program uh, my question is uh, how we can explain Web3 and NFTs in simplest words uh, for a non-technical uh, common person? Great question. Right. Nuno? <laughs> All the tough questions are <laughs> redirected to the lawyer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I think Diogo should do it because engineers have a, have a way to... <laughs> To comprise, to comprise everything in a, in a more binary way, but uh, I can you explain uh, an NFT. Um, it can be so much thing. It can be a digital representation uh, of, of something. It's a, it's a certified digital representation uh, of an asset, independently of it's a tangible or intangible asset. But that, that latest part should be, it's, it's an addition. But I, we should focus on, on the first part. At least that's how I would explain the, an NFT. 
Diego, do you want to have a stab at that as the engineer? Uh, no, I mean, that, that, that works. I think there's many ways for you to look at it. I think the problem with NFTs is that you can come at it from many angles. At its most core, it is exactly um, proof of ownership. An NFT is a digital proof of ownership. It allows you to do one thing, which is you get to prove that you own something that everybody else agrees on what it is. That's it. That's the only thing that it does. It is the same thing as a certificate of authenticity, where you actually trust the provenance, except that the provenance, instead of a certificate of authenticity of a Ferrari being from Ferrari, the provenance is the blockchain. And now everything else can be construed on top of that, of course. What is authenticity? It could be authenticity of an image. It could be a CryptoPunk. It could be a monkey. It could be authenticity, an actual real world item, Let's say authenticity of an actual house deed. And so now it's an NFT that represents a house because it represents a house deed. So it could be representing, like was said by Nuno, tangible, intangible, but at its most core basis, it uses the property of blockchains that allows everybody to agree on the same st state of the network and to prove that I have digital ownership over this particular item. Hey, that helps. We got one more. Um, hi. Um, my name is Ricardo. Um, I have a question. We, you were all, all talking about NFTs more regarding the digital world. What about NFTs representing a physical item? Um, does, doesn't NFT, there's, there's, there's some, some discussion around this about um, using the NFTs to connect to the digital world and to represent that. I would like an opinion if you, if you could uh, regarding this issue. So as in how can NFTs create a link between the digital and the physical world? An, an NFT representing a digi uh, physical item could be, item. Could, could have, could and would have a, a, a digital part, but also as a physical part. Obviously there's some ch challenge here yeah. because you cannot transfer that immediately to, to someone. But uh, there are some things already done wi uh, with this, with uh, NFTs representing physical items. And uh, there's, it's a new thing. It's, it comes with challenges. But if someone wants to uh, say some words about that, it would be nice. Cool. We, we did a really, really interesting uh, project um, with an artist, but with also a, another platform that is named Boson Protocol. Um, and well, their, you know, their their thing is to do the future of e-commerce. So they sell you an NFT uh, that you can resell, but eventually you can redeem it and get like the physical item. And the project we did with an artist that is named Jenny Lee, we mm, so we got a space in the central and we created an entire uh, you know installation with his work. And what we sold as NFTs were skateboards and sneakers that he, he you know hand painted and he created artworks basically. Uh, and people could get the uh, could get the item, and um, they could, when they would redeem it, they would get also the item in the metaverse. So their avatar could get their skateboard on the backpack and get their sneakers, but they would also get the real, like physical, let's say, uh, work at home and shipped by the artist. You know, so there is this. I think this is really interesting, and and the application that you can use it in in both world, and that creates also your identity in in the physical and in the di the digital space. And probably more and more brands will be doing this. Yeah, have you seen similar Fiona physical connections with NFTs? Yes, uh, I think that it should work. Uh, yeah, for instance, Prada they did. Uh, they decided to go from the physical item and, and give, for instance, a free NFT link to the physical product to unlock like benefits and you know like augmented experience about the product. So, so that's one. What is interesting is that for some brands who started from the digital, uh, the digital goods basically, and they sold the digital good first. The value of the digital good exploded. Like for instance, Gucci on Roblox, like a bag basically has been sold much more than what it was. It was the same, but it was sold much more than what it was in real life, for instance. So I think that yeah, it depends on the strategy. Uh, right now, like people want to. I mean, the brands understand the power of, as I said, loyalty and all of this. So they can't give it for free. Sometimes they, they sell it, and uh, it's, it's the digital good in itself that has the most value. Cool, hope that answered. Can I add something to that as well? 
the problem here is to, to, to make the connection between the tangible and intangible. But let's say, let's imagine in, 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 in the near future that uh, all property in the world uh, was within a database and that database connect was connected with some kind of blockchain, some blockchain, it doesn't matter what blockchain it, it is, uh, and all those properties have an NFT representing them. You could, you could send an NFT representing your, uh, your house to another person, and that another person would be the rightful owner of that house. But to, to, uh, to make use of the tangible asset, um, there will, it will always be the need to, to have uh, real world enforcement because NFTs and everything that is blockchain works a lot much, uh, much better when you are natively working on a digital uh, environment, transforming anything that is already digital into an NFT, just to, to talk about NFTs, to make that correlation between physical or real world items to NFTs uh, it will always have to, will always need to have some kind of uh, relationship with a with a company or a person uh, as to assess that the connection is real uh, and that you can can connect both worlds through that way. I don't see it happening in in, in another way in the near future unless you have IoT, uh, Internet of Things, connecting, being serving as oracles and giving that information of real world objects. Uh, injecting that into smart contracts and in, into NFTs uh, and make that assessment without the intervention of a human being. Um, but yeah, I think we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll go that way in the, in the future, but not quite now. It should have an impact on product development as well for, for clothes, basically, because yeah. now more and more like uh, the new clothes are kind of also there is this, this uh, you know, para like uh, this dimension of how to integrate blockchain, how to integrate basically the connection with RFID or within inside, you know, the whole like uh, material uh, to actually make sure that the product will uh, will be authenticated. Uh, it's more complicated for previous product basically. Yeah. Wow. Blockchains in the seams of your clothes. Exactly. That's Very huge. Much. So Patricia, I'd okay, see we've so got to wrap it up, huh? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Diego. Yeah. So thank you to all our speakers and especially you, Tim, uh, to have prepared this uh, session. So now, thank you for everyone watching us from home or, or from the office. Um, now for us that for us that we're here, uh, we'll, we can go upstairs for a drink. Um, I want to remind you that our next hangout will be on the 28th of September. Uh, we'll discuss education and entrepreneurship, so we'll have a special surprise, so stay tuned to our social media and don't miss the next edition. Thank you all. <laughs>